a sermon on Amos chapter 7. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, prophesy there. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters shall fly, uh, fall by the sword and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land and Israel shall surely go into exile from its land. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to start off with a bit of news that I have little doubt will not shock you. And here it is. People in power like to control speech. That is, people in power do not like free speech and they try to shut it down. It's happening right now all over the world. There is little free speech in Russia, in China, in Hong Kong, it's, it's being clamped down on. In parts of the Middle East, in parts of Central America, the government shuts down free speech. And even in those countries where free speech is allowed, countries like the United States, there are many who believe that the tech companies, the lords of platforms such as Google and Facebook and Twitter, use their algorithms to shut down and dismantle free speech there. And in many places, the person whose speech is most feared is, of course, God. The authorities do not like the speech of God, and they do not like those who speak on behalf of God. Well, of course, that's nothing new. In the ancient world, in the Bible, you find that God's word was also not welcomed. And a case in point is the prophet Amos. Amos, in today's reading, ran afoul of two authorities, who didn't much like his preaching or the word of God. The first was King Jeroboam, the ruling monarch of the Northern Kingdom. At the time when Amos preached, the people of God were divided into two kingdoms, the Northern Kingdom Israel, the Southern Kingdom Judah. And the second person who didn't like Amos's free speech was the high priest of the Northern Kingdom, Amaziah from the temple at Bethel. These guys didn't need any algorithms to shut down Amos's speech. They planned on using a much more Iron Age sort of technology, that is, the sword. They thought the sword was more powerful than the pen. And here's the thing about the prophet Amos. People didn't like him. They didn't like his speech, and they didn't like the God who th spoke through him. My retired colleague, Mark Hilmer had a doctoral teacher named Sheldon Brand who said, if you like the prophet Amos, then you don't understand him. And Amaziah and Jeroboam both would have agreed with Professor Brand. First, they didn't like him because he was a foreigner. He was from the Southern Kingdom of Judah and they were the authorities in the North. And second, they didn't like his speech because he was a lay person. Amos was not a trained prophet. He was a farmer by trade. He wasn't licensed. He hadn't been educated. He hadn't been credentialed. And here he was showing up in the Northern Kingdom, preaching against the sins 
of Jeroboam and Amaziah, and in fact, the whole people. Now, Amaziah mistook Amos for a professional prophet, seminary trained, newly ordained, looking to be paid that entry-level pastoral salary in his first call. And Amaziah then said to Amos, go back to Judah, you hick. Find a pulpit there. Earn your salary there. Find some sheep to tend. Don't preach here. This is Bethel. This is the national cathedral of the northern kingdom of Israel. Look at that sign on the wall. You see that sign? Judeans need not apply. So Amos replied, I'm neither a priest nor a prophet. I don't even own a clergy shirt. I'm a farmer and I keep a vineyard. But God called me away from the flocks and away from the vines. And God sent me here because there's a famine of the word of God in your kingdom. So hear the word of the Lord. And then Amos described a vision that God had showed him. And he said, I saw the Lord standing beside a wall with a plumb line in his hand. What do you see, Amos? I see a plumb line. I'm about to set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. Now, the principle of repetition in, uh, is one of the things when you come to the Bible, if a term is repeated several times, it's important. And so, of course, the term here is plumb line. And as a Bible professor at a seminary, when one runs across a word that might be strange, I recommend that people go to find a good Bible dictionary to look it up. And so, of course, I went to my favorite Bible dictionary to look up plumb line, which is called Ace, the place of the friendly Bible dictionary helpers. And here's what it said. A plumb line, right? A plumb line is a device that hangs and it's for making sure that walls are built straight and true. I'm about to set a plumb line in the midst of my people to see if they're living straight and true. Now, as you know, the, a plumb line is a construction device. So the image here is of God as the building inspector to make sure the building is sound. I live in Minnesota. And you may recall about 15 years or so, we had a huge bridge on an interstate over the Mississippi River collapse suddenly. So we know something about the importance of having good building inspectors. The Lord, envisioned here as the building inspector, had a message for the house of Israel. Not only for the house, meaning the whole people of Israel, but for the house of Jeroboam, who was the king, and for the house of God, the temple, the sanctuary, all the houses of worship, I am about to measure you to determine if you are living straight and true. I am going to set this trustworthy measuring device in your midst, and I'm going to come at you. And if you're not straight and true, I will bring judgment. Well, here's the sort of thing that the rest of the book of Amos then says God found. God found that in Israel, the wealthy trampled the poor and they sold them into slavery for the price of a pair of sandals. They found that the people were engaging in exploitative sexual practices. They violated God's commandments with routine, uh, with routine carelessness. They prevented the true prophets from preaching God's word. And that is the specific sin mentioned in this. They said, do not prophesy. They took bribes and courts and cheated victims. The religious sanctuaries were places where offerings and oppressive taxes were collected on behalf of the king. And in the marketplace, illegal weights and measures were used to exploit and commit fraud. And these are just examples of the way that Israel sinned against God and sinned against neighbor. And to all of this, in chapter 5, Amos cried, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Echoing Deuteronomy, Amos said, Choose this day whom you will serve, God in life or sin and death. And they chose sin. They made their beds of ivory and they chose to lie in them. And to all of this preaching, the high priest and the king had an answer. 
Never again prophesy at Bethel, it is the king's sanctuary. Do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Amos. And no wonder, no wonder, given his condemnations, that they wanted to silence the word of God that Amos spoke. Now, according to Amos 1.1, all of Amos's prophetic words were probably spoken in a single year, meaning that just after a short time, the authorities had enough and they silenced him. They may have deported him back to his home country of Judah, or like the prophets Micaiah and Jeremiah, they may have thrown him in jail, or perhaps like John the Baptist or Martin Luther King Jr. and countless preachers throughout the century, they may simply have murdered him. The authorities will often go to the farthest extreme to silence those who preach the word of God. But the word survived. The word survived. His disciples wrote it down and brought it to us today. And before you're too quick to judge Amaziah and Jeroboam, Amos would want you to know that his words of condemnation also apply to you and to me. Remember the words of Professor Brand. If you think you like the prophet Amos, then you don't understand him. If Amos were here today, he would want you to know that you and I are little different, scarcely better than Amaziah and Jeroboam. Amos's words are here today, so Amos' words continue to preach, and they continue to say, God is a building inspector looking at the house in which you and I live spiritually and asking, are all the electrical circuits true? Is every plumbing fixture workable? Is the foundation sound so that the building won't collapse? Well, speaking of foundations and houses, I'm reminded of another spiritual inspector in the Bible. And the authorities also tried to silence this preacher. This other preacher once said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house upon rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. Now, there's a bit of good news here for people, even like you and I, whose spiritual houses are not in perfect order. And the bit of good news here is that the glass house in which I live, in which the windows have already been smashed, and in which all of the kettles are smudged with hypocritical soot, that very house is the dwelling place of God. You see, this other preacher, was not only one who spoke the word, he was himself the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. A friend of mine likes to say this, God has spoken a word of love, grace, and forgiveness to the entire world. His name is Jesus. God has spoken a word of love to the world. His name is Jesus. And this word that the second preacher spoke, in fact, this word who was the word of God spoken in love to us, lives in us, lives in us. When God sets then the plumb line in our spiritual house to see if things are good and true and upright, and if the foundation is strong, God does not see us, but rather God sees the word that he has spoken to the world, that word that has moved into the neighborhood and in fact dwells within each and every one of us. A later apostle put it this way, you are the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.